Hello Internet, Seth Skorkowski, and welcome to part 10 of our massive review slash overview for Mongoose Traveler 2nd Edition. Over the last nine episodes, almost four hours now, we've covered all the basics from character creation, skill mechanics, combat, psionics, spaceships, and more. And while that certainly has been a lot of information, with everything I've discussed, save for a few things and I've pointed out when those came from other resources, everything has only come from the main core rulebook. But even with all that, there's still a few details that really weren't able to fit into any particular episode, or might have been things that I didn't mention in certain videos until, you know, I didn't even think about it until after that video was posted and I received feedback for them. So that's what we're going to cover today. Final thoughts. A big haphazard assortment of updates, corrections, expansions, and overall tips for running or playing Traveler. And to start this off, let's go ahead and just rip the tape off and get the hard part over with. Mistakes. Over the course of the series, I have made a few mistakes. During character creation, I brought up connection skills, when two characters link events from their backstories and each get a skill level from that. In there I said that it was going to be the same skill, such as both characters got a level of gunner turret, or both characters got a level of gambling. That was wrong. Each character gets one skill that's related to that shared connection that they have from their backstories, but they don't have to be the same skills as one another. So one character might have gotten pilot's small craft when they stole a shuttle together, and the other character might have gotten engineering or mechanics because they were the ones trying to keep that ship together. Or maybe the other character got turret gunner because they were trying to keep people off their tail. Or maybe they got electronics computers because they were the ones that hacked their way inside the shuttle. Whatever it is doesn't matter as long as both skills come from those characters' shared backstory. Another thing that I've also said is that the contents of the starter set and the core book were the same, just spread out between two books when it comes to the starter set. Evidently, that's not 100% correct. Ship stats are different. The most notable part is that the starter set doesn't say fuel costs for jumps. The simple formula, in case you don't have it in your book, is that fuel is 10 tons per parsec for every 100 tons that the ship is. So a 200 ton free trader making a jump 1 is 20 tons of fuel, while Jack's 100 ton scout ship is 10 tons for a jump 1, or 20 tons for a jump 2. The topic is mostly moot now, Mongoose has announced that the starter set has been discontinued to be replaced with something else at a future date. I have no clue what that might be, but for those of you out there that already picked up a copy of the starter set, I apologize. Evidently, jump fuel costs weren't in there. Next, in episode 6 on space combat, I pointed out that the power requirements for ship weapons are not in the core book. I was wrong about that. They appear in the ship operations chapter on page 144. My bad. And finally, my biggest mistake that I'm aware of is in Episode 9 concerning trade. For passengers, I said that we use the total effect of the roll to determine the number of passengers that we then roll for. I forgot the part where you also add 2d6, which is clearly noted right there at the top of the chart, and I totally missed it. Also, the exact same thing concerning freight. I totally missed the part where you get to apply the effect of the previous rolls to an additional 2d6 to get the number of lots. My mistake. Okay, now that the distasteful part of my own failings is out of the way, let's get to the fun stuff. Character options. So during character creation, I showed a blank stat box on my customized character sheet, and I mentioned how this is for the optional luck stat, which we use for our game, but we weren't going to worry about it that time at the example video. Well, now's the time to talk about it. The Traveler Companion gives us several optional stats that players might want to use, one of which is luck. How luck works is it's just a normal stat. You roll 2d6 to determine it. It gets its own dice modifier when you're making luck rolls. Now, luck rolls can be used to determine random events, such as which character gets hit during a micrometeor storm. Or if some bad event needs to happen to a character for story reasons, a luck roll can help determine which unfortunate character that's going to be. Or if a player forgot to write down some piece of equipment, or they forgot to announce they were not going to pick something up, and now it's later on and the player is asking, can we go ahead and say that I, I have that even though I don't have it on my character sheet, and the game master has to make a judgment call, and uh, they don't want to say no because now they're kind of like a jerk bad guy, but they don't want to say just yes because it means that the players might not you know, be active enough to write everything down. Have everybody just make a luck roll to see if any of their characters remembered to pick up a spare piece of whatever that a piece of equipment 
equipment was, such as, you know, an extra rifle or air tank or whatever it was. Little things like that where you can use luck in order to help make those determinations if a game master doesn't really want to make the call themselves. But the big benefit that luck gives is that it can help with task checks. So let's say that Jack's luck skill is a 9, and he gets a plus 1 dice modifier for that. Whenever he's about to make a particularly important roll, such as he's trying to dock a ship in battle, but he's had some engine damage, so he's got a minus 1 to that, before making that skill roll, he just announces how much luck he wants to use on that particular roll. So he says, I want to use 2 points of luck for that. That's going to reduce his luck stat down to 7, removing that plus 1 DM, but now he gets to add those 2 points to that particular skill roll. Now, maybe he rolls really well and he didn't even need those two points of luck to begin with, or maybe he rolls really, really badly and those two points weren't enough to bring him from a failure to a success, but either way, the luck points are still spent. This luck pool has saved our butts more times than we can count. Not as much because those few points of luck were able to turn a roll that would have been unsuccessful into a successful roll, but more along the lines of once a player declares that they're going to use a few points of luck on a roll, the dice just somehow seem to hear that, and they roll supernaturally good in that roll, which leaves the player thinking that maybe they wasted a few points of luck in a roll when they really didn't need the luck at all. It is weird how often that happens. Luck can also be used to give another character a minus, uh, such as a bad guy is trying to shoot you, so you spend three points of luck to give them a minus three on the roll to hit you. Now, you can't give another character a plus, like you can't help your buddy make his roll by giving him a few points of your luck. Uh, it's either simply giving pluses to your own rolls or giving minuses to somebody else's rolls. Of course, as a character's luck pool goes down, it's going to make it more likely that they're going to fail any future luck rolls. The luck pool goes back up to full at the beginning beginning of the next adventure. But the other big thing that luck does is it can save a character from death. Travelers, you might have noticed, is a lethal system. Characters can get killed very suddenly in a wide variety of ways. So when a character dies, a game master might allow them to use luck as a means of saving themselves. The player simply makes a roll at difficulty 12. They don't add their luck's dice modifier to this. Instead, they permanently spend luck points to make up that difference. So if they rolled 2d6 and they got an 8, they would then permanently reduce their luck stat by 4 points in order to bring that 4 up to a 12. 12, which would allow their character to survive. I also suggest that the other players around the table, not just the player that survived whatever it was, they all help come up with whatever excuse we're going to say as to how that character managed to survive something that normally should have killed them. Uh, maybe they managed to grab a branch as they were falling off of a cliff, or uh, maybe as their ship was exploding around them, they raced to the ship's locker and managed to get themselves inside of an emergency bubble in time, so now they're kind of floating in this little bubble as the debris field of their ship is just floating all around them. Or that plasma round blew a hole straight through their body while missing every vital organ. There are other optional stats. Charm might be used instead of social, uh, because charm is considered more like charisma is in other games, while social in the Traveler universe has more to do with your, your social class, like, you know, are you noble-born or not? So charm might be really useful whenever you're trying to do persuades, and we don't really want to worry about whatever class system that this planet or this galaxy might happen to have. Wealth is just a general measure of how wealthy a character is, and represents disposable income that they might have on them, meaning that for smaller purchases like that, we don't have any bookkeeping as far as tracking whatever the character's money is. For those that play Call of Cthulhu 7th Edition, this is pretty much how credit rating works in that, so this should feel familiar to you. There's also the morale skill, which can be used to measure a character's morale. There's also a sanity skill, which might be useful if you're wanting to do any sort of sci-fi horror games. During one of the Kickstarters, and I completely forgot which one it was, Mongoose gave out these character sheets that have spaces for all the optional skills. I love these character sheets, and I wish Mongoose would put them or some variant like them on their website's download page, because I would love other people to have access to these sheets, because they are way better than the ones that are currently there. Next is benefits. I touched on this briefly at one point in the series, and I was talking about weapons and how we could upgrade our weapons, but some of the other benefits that we can get during character character creation can give you armor, augments, weapons, vehicles, or other equipment up to a certain credit value, such as Jack got his wafer jack during character creation. Now, any unspent credits that he was allotted for that, such as his benefit had a budget of up to 50,000 credits, but the wafer jack was only 10,000 credits, 
I would allow a player character to spend whatever remaining budget they have on different upgrades or different options for whatever that benefit was, uh, such as for this wafer jack, maybe getting program chips or having it ruggedized or some other options like that. Now this money can only go towards that chosen item that they got from the benefit and any unused funds just go away. But for me, if a player does have a large enough benefit budget, you know, and they can still upgrade any armor that they got or weapons or whatever benefit it was that they rolled, I would go ahead and let them do that for up to the specified dollar amount that that benefit allotted. Next is aliens. Most of Traveler is pretty much under the assumption that the player characters are most likely going to be playing human, but there are several alien races they could be playing instead, and you can find the various races in different books, such as Behind the Claw or the various volumes of the Journal of the Traveler's Aid Society or other places in different publications. However, two books have come out since this video series has started. Aliens of Chartered Space Volumes 1 and 2, and these give us much more detailed information on playing various races or other types of human, including new life paths and careers that alien travelers can take. Such as, let's say you wanted to play a Varger character who grew up in Varger society before they mustered out and became a traveler and joined the rest of the group. A player can choose to go through the Varger-specific life path that's geared around their particular culture, they can have Varger-specific gear and equipment that they could have, or Varger-specific spaceships. These books are pretty cool, and they're a valuable resource for game masters or players to get information about different alien species or cultures, equipment, or characters. Now into Game Master tips for running Traveler. The first advice that I received when I announced that I was looking into playing Traveler was from a very seasoned player who'd been playing the game since the late 70s, early 80s, and his big tip to me was to keep the campaign limited to a single sector or even to a single subsector and let the player characters get to know that region and let them get to see how their own actions might change the different variables that are going on inside that region. Space, as we've discussed, is huge, and group that might adventure one week on one side of the galaxy, and the next week they're having an adventure on the far side of the galaxy, and they never go back to those places that they've previously visited, they're not ever going to see the larger effects of their actions, you know, how that planet or how that region might be changing due to what adventure they did there and how they might have changed the particular political dynamic or whatnot, and they're not going to get the same sense of feeling the game world as a player is going to have if they're kind of playing around in the same area of planets and getting to see how that world is changing because of the actions that their characters have taken. And now that I've played Traveler for a little while, I agree with that advice. Next is to use the ship. The Traveler's ship is an endless resource for adventure hooks. A sudden breakdown might send them down to a random planet, or a strange message or map might be uncovered deep, buried in their ship's computer by a previous owner. Or some artifact might be hidden behind a wall panel that the Travelers never knew about, and that artifact sends them off on an adventure somewhere. Or maybe somebody comes looking for this artifact and they know it's on the ship, so now the travelers have got these people chasing them and trying to get onto their ship and the travelers don't know why, and then they find this artifact and they're trying to debate, should we give it to these people to get them off our back, or maybe we should use it because it leads to somewhere important. I strongly recommend that you give your players a 2D deck plan of their ship, you know, let them choose whichever rooms are theirs, buy upgrades or personalizations, uh, maybe change the paint job of the ship, you know, make it theirs, and then use this ship to give them their adventures. Now on to contacts. During character creation, we touched on allies, contacts, enemies, and rivals that a character can make during character creation. Players need to flesh these NPCs out a bit. You know, give us some details about them. You know, who are they? What do they do? What's their name? Give us something about these people, right? The Traveler Companion gives us some expanded rules on how to determine an NPC's power and influence. Game Masters, I strongly encourage that you use these NPC contacts or allies whenever it is that you can. Can. They can become the patrons for the PCs, you know, offering them a job, or they could become an enemy that the player characters have to overcome, or they can just be a contact that the player characters can call on to help get them out of a bind that they might have found themselves in. However, while the player certainly has a big say in you know, who that NPC was whenever they met them, Game Masters shouldn't feel limited by that information. You see, the, the player's information about this NPC is from their backstory, which might have taken place 
four years ago, it might have taken place 20 years ago. So the player gets to say who it was this NPC was, but you as the Game Master get to decide who that NPC is now. For example, let's look at Lando Calrissian. During Han Solo's backstory, he made an ally named Lando, who was a scoundrel and a gambler and just damn smooth. Later on in Empire Strikes Back, Han's ship is broken down, and he's searching for a safe place to take the Falcon to get it fixed, when the Game Master decides to bring in this character from Han's backstory. However, Lando is now a respectable ruler of a city. His role has completely changed changed from what it was four terms ago when he met Han. So remember that while a player character has certainly grown and changed and maybe changed career multiple times since whenever it was that they made this contact, the NPC contact has probably grown and changed and changed careers multiple times as well. That means that Game Masters should feel free to go ahead and change and modify the different details about this NPC as to who they are now in order to fit them into the new campaign, because sometimes when the player comes up with these NPC contacts or allies or enemies, you look at it and you're like, how am I even going to fit this into the current campaign, well, you're allowed to change the character off of who they are now in order to fit them in because, once again, I highly encourage you to do that. Another tool that Game Masters might want to use is minis. I have a decent set of Traveler miniatures that I use, I might do a video about those eventually, but there's something that I do get asked about a lot. First, you do not need to use miniatures to play Traveler, it's like any other tabletop game out there, you can do it purely theater of the mind if you want to and you don't want to bother with miniatures. But for those of you out there that want to use minis, there are a few questions about how to find them and where to find them. Unfortunately, there's no current producer for Traveler miniatures that I'm aware of. Rafam has done them, as did Grenadier in both 15 and 25 millimeter. For me, I hunt for them on eBay. I tend to avoid the human traveler miniatures because I can find a ton of human sci-fi miniatures from a lot of other places out there a whole lot easier and a lot better quality. But alien races such as the Varger and the Hiver and the Aslan, I still hunt for old traveler miniatures. Traveler ship miniatures can also be a bit tricky to find, but uh, you can find some out there that are metal, but they're all of different sizes and scales from one another, and you don't really get a sense of size whenever you compare them. But I've really enjoyed the 3D printed ones from Four Even Shipyard, and those are all to scale with each other and have really good detail. I'll stick a link below to Four Even Shipyards. Now, for my games, I will blow up a 2D ship deck plan to be scale with the miniatures that we can use those as our ship. And again, minis aren't necessary, but I really do get a kick out of using them. Next, let's look at house rules. Little tweaks you might employ to personalize your game. I have a few house rules that I've employed and a few others that I've considered. One is inspiration, which I totally stole from 5th edition Dungeons and & Dragons and have used that in a wide variety of different game systems. Essentially, if a player does something really good, such as a clever idea or good role playing or something that really impresses me, I give them inspiration. In the days before COVID, when we all used to be able to play in the same room together, I would give them a coin that represents this. Essentially, a player can only have one inspiration at a time. You can't stack it up or hoard them. You either have inspiration or you don't. They can also give them to one another if a certain player character wants to do some important role or maybe as a way of thanking another character for maybe saving their bacon at some point like that. However, the rule still applies that you can't have multiple ones, so yeah, you can't give up character inspiration inspiration if they already have it, but I find it a very fun mechanic and it has been very successful for us in a wide variety of games, including Traveler. Next, while auto weapons have three fire modes, single, full, and burst, some players have complained that burst fire seems a little bit weak when compared to full auto. A suggestion that one viewer mentioned when we were discussing this is maybe giving burst fire a plus to hit equal to its auto rating and simply instead of just adding the auto rating to whatever the damage is if it hits, uh, after all, if you give it a plus to hit and it hits above whatever the minimum is, the effect can translate into more damage, so it actually kind of works out to being the same as damage, but also improves the chances to hit, making burst fire something that sounds really, really desirable. Another variant might be to keep the plus to the burst fire's damage just like normal, but add a boon die to the burst fire's to hit roll. 
I've never employed either variant on that itself. I just use Burst Fire like normal, though I have considered doing the one where you add it to the effect like that. But I like the sound of them, so I figured I'd just go ahead and share them with the, the other game masters out there, see if they might want to try it for themselves. Next, for trade, another house rule that I haven't used, but I do like the sound of it, is that it should be more difficult to get passengers and cargo for more distant locations than it would be for the closer ones. Uh, one game master suggested giving a DM minus one for every jump traveled after the first one for both cargo and passengers, meaning that it should be easier to get passengers that are willing to travel, you know, one week for a jump versus uh, having them on board for six weeks across the course of six jumps. Finally, alternate experience points. I mentioned in an earlier video how we employ the experience point system that you can find in the Traveler Companion, and I gave a few details about that during the course of that video. Now, since we did that video, I have adapted a modification for that that has gone over very well for us. So instead of just awarding a set number of experience points at the end of a, an adventure, at the end of a session, that the players then get to apply to any skills, and I already said that it had to be skills that they used or they trained in during the course of that adventure, I now have them just track which skills it was that they were successful in. Meaning that if they tried a skill roll that was at least eight difficulty and they were successful, they just note it next to that skill. They don't note it for every single success that they have, just as if it was used successfully at any point during the adventure or session, or whatever the term is. So if they get 15 successes, it doesn't matter, it's only a single mark. Then, at the end of the session or the adventure, they then roll a d6 minus 1 for each skill that was successfully used. If they get their current skill level or higher, they get 1 XP in that skill. A result of 5 being the maximum is going to always be a success. They also get a single free experience point that they could place under any any skill or characteristic that they used or trained in. I found that this system works very well for us. They usually do advance a little bit faster than they would at doing it by the other system, but a big part of that is that if we do it this way, the players are more apt and you know, more likely to be using their skills. If getting a chance to improve your skills requires that they're active in the game and that they're always trying to make skill rolls so they can get that successful one and maybe get an improvement at the end of the adventure, then the players tend to be more active active in the game, and everybody's very involved in that, and I prefer to reward players who are more active in a game than uh, rewarding ones that showed up. They kind of did the minimum amount of, you know, being involved with everything. This method might not work for a lot of groups. It might not even work for most groups that are out there, but it has worked very well for us, so I recommend that as an option that you might want to consider using in your own game. Finally, let's look at criticisms. I do have a few criticisms of Traveler. I've mentioned several over the course of this series. First, and my biggest one, while the core book does cover a ton of stuff that they managed to pack in there, there is a serious shortage of examples, which has led to a lot of confusion and a lot of debates. I really wish we had more examples. I know that that would increase the size of the book, which might increase the cost of the book, but I would really prefer to have easy to understand examples under every single rule. Uh, that way it's a lot clearer and we don't have all the debates and arguments and we know exactly what the rules mean instead of having to think about it and ponder it, because that just drives me crazy. I wouldn't go that far. You've always seemed like a pretty normal guy to me. Another that I've mentioned before is art. The art in Traveler is okay. They've got a lot of it, and the art is of high quality, but it's also pretty bland and static. There's no real action or story to it. I will say that since this series has begun, over the past year, the newer books have fixed that, and the art has become much more evocative, giving us action scenes that feel like snapshots from a story. And I've been using much of this better art in my more recent videos, so you might have noticed that the art is improving over the course of these episodes, and that's because Mongoose has really started upping their art. So thank you, Mongoose, for that. I have noticed, and I do appreciate it. Keep this up. So I'm going to go ahead and strike this criticism off. The new art has been wonderful. The last is deck plans. The core book and High Guard give us a lot of ship deck plans, and they're presented in this 3D isometric design. It is really cool to look at, but it is terrible to use in game. Now, you can download 2D deck plans from the Mongoose website for free, and I really do appreciate that. However, with all the different books and adventures that come out, we've gotten a lot more ships that are available for us, but no more 2D deck plans are ever offered for them. For example, in my most recent game, I had the travelers exploring an abandoned ship. 
I chose this ship from the Great Rift box set because I liked the design of it and it wasn't anything that the players were going to be familiar with already. Unfortunately, the 3D deck plan was a pain for us to use in-game. I managed to do it, but have much preferred a 2D variant in our virtual tabletop as they explored this vessel. So Mongoose, going forward, I would love any ship deck plans that you introduce to also have a 2D variant somewhere that we could find. I love the isometric look. I love the way I can help visualize how the different decks go together. Uh, they look beautiful, but I find the 2D ones just a lot easier for us to use in our games. Okay. That's it. We're done? I think so. Wow. That feels good. It should. I mean, this series took, what, like 10 months to complete? Feels like the end of an era, but now we can put all of this behind us. Mostly, there's still a few other little things I want to do. So are you done or not? I'm confused here. Well, I'm done with a core book, but there's a few other areas that need to be discussed, namely ships. Highguard gives us a ton of information about building and modifying ships, and I want to look into doing that one now that the core book series is done. Well, no rest for the wicked, I suppose, but at least this first term at doing the core book we can call complete. Yes, we can. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, such as Game Master Toolbox and Tabletop War Stories, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, travelers, you have a great day. You know, my big complaint with Mongoose Traveler is that I would like a lot more information about robots. I mean, yeah, we get a decent selection of them in the Central Supply Catalog, but I would like a lot more than that. I want rules on how to make robots, or maybe even get to play a robotic player character, because that would be pretty sweet. Or maybe I'd just like to have a robot sidekick, you know, kind of like my companion that can keep me company. I, uh, I get lonely.